This is the American Law Journal. Maybe the t-shirt wisdom is accurate. Maybe old guys do rule according to the latest EEOC guidelines and a few whopping court verdicts, not to mention the U.S. Supreme Court. Employers better be more careful about who they cut and that goes for lawyers as well. Good evening, I'm Christopher Naughton, and welcome to the American Law Journal. Tonight, the latest in age discrimination on the job. Three guests, let's join them. Anthony Haller hails from Blank Rome. He is a partner with that law firm, and he heads the employment benefits and labor practice for the international law firm. Mary Tiernan is with the EEOC. Over two decades of experience trying age, race, sex, retaliation, and other types of discrimination cases. The EEOC with its offices in Philadelphia. And Scott Goldshaw steps up to the plate for the first time on ALJ. He has been practicing now for over 15 years. In the area of employment litigation, a huge feather in his cap, he just recently represented plaintiffs before the Third Circuit, that's one step south of the Supreme Court, and garnered several million dollar verdicts in those cases, which we will get to tonight. But first, let's take a look at this video. This is, in all honesty, is an actor, but I think that this video is emblematic of what a lot of 50-somethings are going through in the country right now, and it does raise an authentic question. If you were in his shoes, would you have an age discrimination case? I'm 57 years old and I've been with my company for nine years as a director, managing a team of about 40 people. But business slowed down and several employees, including myself, were laid off. When I was let go, I was provided with a separation agreement, which I was about to sign until I learned that the company hired a woman in her 30s to do my job, just under a different title. After hearing about my much younger replacement, I did a little research and found that many of those who were let go were also in their 50s, just like me. I found this alarming. Did they discriminate against me because of my age? All right, so he may not have been the best actor in the world. However, I think the facts do speak for themselves. It's a fact pattern that all three of you have heard, heard of uh, at some point in time in your careers. And I'm a little confused. We have the Supreme Court has come down with a couple of cases in just the last few years. We have this case that's gone to the Third Circuit that you just tried, Scott. And the EEOC guidelines, which have just come down the pike. And ARP is absolutely giddy about them, but I don't know what the standard is. I'm a 50 plus man who's just been fired. What is the basis for me pursuing an age discrimination claim? Is it disparate impact? Is it but for? What is the standard today? Well, let me, uh, from the defense perspective, give you a, a simple answer. I think that there are two types of discrimination. One is disparate treatment, where you personally are saying, uh, somebody did something to me because of my age. In this example, I was chosen as one of the people laid off because of my age. Mm -hmm. There's a different type of dis, um, discrimination, which is called disparate impact, where there's a neutral policy. For instance, in this case, if they said, as in the case Scott tried, that um, it was a re result of a um, depletion of funding for certain programs. Mm -hmm. A reduction then, a re in force. And then right? the question is, does that did that neutral policy, sounds neutral, have an, a, a disparate impact on older people? Yeah. Those are two types of cases, and they're different types of relief. The, the disparate impact can be brought as a case not on behalf of just one person, but on behalf of an entire group of people. Mary, I know that's part of the EEOC guidelines. They have just come down. You folks have just issued them, and, and again, I, I said that ARP was... Uh, was giddy about them, and they, and they really are. Why is ARP? Why are people who are uh, over 40 have something to celebrate here, or is it, or, or are we celebrating something that was already in the law? Well, EEOC had said that um, we could show disparate impact. You know that you had this neutral criteria, but it had a disproportionate or harsher impact based on age. In the recent Supreme Court cases, they said you know if the employer can show a reasonable factor other than age, that would be a defense. Our regulations are helping clarify that, um, giving I some think. considerations for employers on how they could uh, meet that burden of showing reasonable factor other than age. You know, was it, um, did they implement it, did they design it to have a legitimate business purpose, taking into account the whole circumstances and what is the potential harm for older workers? So I, I think it's, it's important clarification for employees 
applicants and for employers so that they can you know, navigate these uh, new considerations and, and be in compliance with the age law. So let me see if I understand this. So I'm working, I'm over 50, and years past it might be, okay, I had to show somehow that the employer was really intending to treat me differently than people who are under 40. Now I don't have to really show that intent. I could say I'm one of 10 people that got fired and nine of us were all over 50. That shows on its face that it had a disproportionate impact on us old guys. Doesn't that now shift the burden over to the employer to say, okay, you got me there, you're right, nine out of 10 people, you're older folks, we did move you, but here are the reasonable factors why, and here's my defense. Is that it in a nutshell? I wouldn't go so fast. I think that in order to avail yourself of the disparate impact theory, you have to first identify a facially neutral policy. And in many of these cases, um, the decisions are made without reference to a facially neutral policy, such as an employer on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis decides which employees to select for termination and which employees to retain. In those situations, you would still most likely um, be restricted to the traditional disparate impact, disparate treatment uh, theory of discrimination okay. where you must show intentional age discrimination. Okay, interesting. So that is still in play. So I think Scott's right. You've got to be careful. It's not always best to go down the road of disparate impact. I, I suspect in many cases what you want to show is that, mm. that there was specific adverse treatment of this individual that can get a jury riled up. What's sexy about the disparate impact cases is that you can aggregate them. That is, you can bring them on behalf of a wide group. And under this statute, you don't have the same roadblocks that you do under some of the rules that apply in other statutes to do that kind of combination of people. So, so, you, you, so you can get everybody. Class you pull action. The, exactly. You can pull everybody together in what's called a collective action. Mm -hmm. And that puts a lot of pressure on the employer because the stakes are very high if it has to get tried. Let's go to this case that you handled, Scott. And again, uh, here's a case that gets up to the Third Circuit, which, as I mentioned earlier, is, is one step below the Supremes. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah, and um, interestingly enough, uh, the fact pattern of our case started out uh, a little bit similarly to the fact pattern that the actor um, used at the beginning of the case, where uh, Bonnie Marcus and Roman Weipart were dedicated scientists with long careers at the uh, corporation, and um, they uh, were notified that they were being uh, laid off um, as a result of a reduction in force, then looked around, noticed that the layoffs seemed to target the older workers over age 55, and that um, they later found out that their job duties had been in um, significant portion taken over by younger workers. That was a case that went to trial. The jury found that um, the corporation um, not only uh, based the decision on age, which makes it against the law, but that the company knew it was uh, breaking the law at the time and awarded uh, extra damages based on that willfulness. And these are, these are the initial damages up on the screen here. White Part uh, initially received uh, over 500,000 in lost wages, 2 million in emotional distress. Bonnie Marcus, uh, 1.3 plus million in lost wages, 1.5 in emotional distress. I know that some of those numbers have been changed and some dramatically. Sometimes we see the, the headlines and we see, oh, someone's won millions of dollars, they've won the lottery, and then no one hears about the fact that the judge said, oh, will you take 50,000 instead of uh, a two million? It's true, but by any measure, these are um, substantial verdicts and verdicts right. that are quite large in the employment mm -hmm. discrimination field. Right. Um, Anthony, you're going to comment. Well, it's certainly a feather in Scott's cap. I have to say that's a very large verdict. I think if you look at the statistics um, in the majority of cases, the defense wins, the employer wins these, these type of cases. And a recent um, jury uh, research analysis of jury verdicts has a range of something from 30,000 up to 52 million, but the average is something in around 332 of those cases that win. So these cases don't generally get the kind of result, but they can get... Um, to a point where juries feel very angry about the circumstances. And that comes back to emphasizing the disparate treatment aspect of the case, I think is very important. And the sense that the employer didn't really care or is, mm -hmm. is giving reasons that don't make sense or contradicting the reasons. And those things get, get juries inflamed. I think um, what if I'm hearing what Anthony's saying, you really better have, is this right to say, Anthony, some intention there, some sort of marker that suggests that it wasn't just happenstance that this happened. There was uh, almost a concerted effort 
to remove people well, who are that old. I'm going to agree with part but disagree with part of what Anthony said. It's true that our case, uh, for example, was a disparate treatment case requiring proof mm -hmm. that age was intentionally taken into consideration. Um, however, make no mistake that the large verdicts um, that uh, we saw were a result of the fact that age discrimination really hurts. These are real people and the damages that they suffered as a result of the violations of law that they proved unanimously to a jury, to a unanimous jury, uh, were quite large. The uh, non-economic, uh, the economic damages uh, were substantial and uh, were based on it actual like losses. It looks like punitive damages. There were no punitive damages I understand in this that, case. but the numbers almost suggest that. Um, well, let's break it down then, because the wages um, for each of the plaintiffs were uh, comprising a very substantial portion of the award, and the portion that uh, corresponded to non-economic damages consisted largely of what we call compensatory damages, um, measuring emotional distress. And I think that the jury, um, all eight unanimously agreed that the emotional distress that these people, Bonnie and Roman, suffered was um, quite substantial and placed a, a dollar value on it that they felt was appropriate. I was not involved in the case, I don't know all the facts, right. but Scott had some, some evidence of comments that, that suggested stereotyping. Uh, he had the, 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 the statistical analysis, which is that everybody was basically older uh, that was impacted by the decision making. Mm -hmm. and, and most importantly, from my perspective, he had explanations that were inconsistent. As an employee, you have to be consistent. If you have a legitimate business reason for what you're doing, you should know it, you should be able to express it, and you should be able to be consistent about it. It's right. very simple. Especially on the stand. When we come back, silver is suddenly in style, but is it okay to go gray at work? And is mandatory age retirement legal or is it against the law? And what if we're talking about a law firm here? We'll be back in just a minute. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Blank Rome, providing strategic advice for employers in today's workplace. Scheller PC, protecting consumer rights since 1977. And The Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers. Anthony, you can make up rules so long as they have a valid business reason and so long as they don't create an unequal an unequal burden upon men and women, and in fact, in this case, there is no evidence that's been presented to the court that suggests that the burden on this particular individual to wear makeup was greater than the burden on men to comply with the rules that were imposed upon them. Anthony. And for that reason, clearly you lose. Anthony. And one of our guests, uh, Anthony Howler, debating with Alice Ballard at the Union League going back a few years ago. And Anthony, in just a moment, I want to ask you about that debate. Uh, Anthony Haller joining us tonight with Blank Rome, a partner with that law firm, handling employment cases now for several decades. Mary Tiernan is with the EEOC in Philadelphia. And Scott Goldshaw joins us tonight from Salmonson Goldshaw, uh, winning a big case before the Third Circuit, the Marcus V. PQ Corporation, millions of dollars uh, for that uh, employment case. Uh, Anthony, in that particular debate with Alice Ballard, uh, you were arguing about the Jesperson case. This was a personal best policy that Harris Casino had uh, essentially required women to wear makeup and you argued, well, as long as they're telling men that they have to trim their beards and cut their hair, there's no problem. You won. Now, someone comes to you or an employer comes to you and says, I want my women uh, who work at this bar, at this Harris Casino, to color their hair. I don't need old people serving liquor to our patrons. Do you tell them, well, as long as the men have to color their hair, we're OK here? You see, I don't think that argument works in that <laughs> circumstance. It um, really well, does it. Other limb because right, the right, problem right. is um, in both both are age related, and and therefore I think um, that policy would be defective under the age statute. Okay, all right. And because bringing it in the age and sex combined, because sometimes women of a certain age could be treated more harshly in the workplace. Yeah, although in that case, a woman was told she had to wear makeup, and, and Alice Ballard uh, stoically argued in, in our, our debate there that uh, 
it's it's a lot more to tell women they have to wear makeup than to tell a man he's he's got to trim his beard or his hair. But that's another case at another time. But that's the great the thing about age chasers is that it's 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 a protected category that all of us one day will experience. And yeah, we can all relate to it. And and it's either you're you're there and you've experienced it, or you have a parent who's experienced it, or you have a relative who's experienced or a friend. So I think it's something that's very real to people, and that's why they can get angry, as Scott found out, and to his benefit. Well, age discrimination, however, does not always apply. There are some exceptions. Let's take a look at a few of these. Companies with 15 or less employees, age discrimination is not a factor. If you have less than 15 employees, you can fire someone based on age. We're going to get to some of the caveats here in just a moment. Employees under 40 years of age. If a boss says, we don't want to hire people in their 20s, probably not a cause of action there. And then also under the uh, Tabor Hosanna case that came down from the Supreme Court earlier this year, you might have a ministerial exception. There might be religious organizations uh, that would be able to sidestep so-called age discrimination. So does my little list here stand up to scrutiny from either plaintiff or defense bar? I think that we need to uh, remember that state laws also uh, come into play to prevent age discrimination under their laws in order to complement the federal law on age discrimination. And so, for example, um, in the state of Pennsylvania, um, you only need four employees in order to be covered by the age discrimination right. statutes. And right. the same is true with regard to the age um, for protected people. In some states, I'm thinking of New Jersey in particular, you can be younger than 40 and be protected by the age discrimination statutes. Right, but those are states that have, cut, have, have basically uh, carved out more rights for individuals. We're really talking about the federal standard. Well, if New Jersey, uh, their Land Act, uh, Law Against Discrimination, their LAD Act, uh, says you can't discriminate uh, against someone who based on sexual orientation. Philadelphia, Allentown, other cities have that. That's right. But we're really but but there's no federal statute and states don't have to follow that. But if you have if you if you're looking at a reduction in force and you say in and you're doing it in New Jersey and you say, well, we're not going to make the mistake that the employer made in Scott's case, so we're going to pick all the younger people. Well that's a problem in New Jersey. You can't do that. Right. So the two things do really conflict and, and there's a good deal of interplay between federal and state law in this area. So uh, are they just more enlightened in New Jersey, Scott? According to plaintiffs, bar, I'm sure you're thinking that, that such laws should exist in other states. Yeah, I think the, the enlightened ones are the employers that don't discriminate on the basis of age, regardless of whether it's protected under a particular statute or not. If you look at the statistics, the percentage of, peop of people coming back in the workforce, 48% of them are over the age of 50. Yes. So, so there is a sense, and, I, and I'm not an expert in this area, um, that Older people are getting jobs that younger people want, right. and they are blocking people either from getting jobs or from the upward mobility within corporations. And couldn't you argue about disparate impact there, Attorney Haller? You could. You could. You, you right. absolutely can make that yeah. argument. Mm -hmm. Well, lawyers better beware as well. We know that sometimes uh, when it comes to age, race, sex, discrimination cases, retaliation uh, cases, law firms are sometimes the petri dish for those uh, kinds of litmus tests. We've got a case that has come up uh, with uh, Kelly Dry and Warren. That's a brouhaha about a 70-year-old attorney who said, they told me I had to quit being an equity partner when I reached the age of 70. The ABA doesn't like the fact that there's such a thing as mandatory retirement. The EOC doesn't like the fact that there's mandatory retirement. Is mandatory retirement equal to age discrimination? Well, I think it is, and the statute itself prohibits, with some very narrow exceptions, uh, mandatory retirement age. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what the statute did, and I think it's, it's helped many people through their careers. But this is a different issue in a sense, because the, the, the question in this case and there was a similar case the EOC brought in Chicago involving Sidley Austin, is whether a partner in a law firm is an employee. So the, the, the law firms defend on the basis, well, they're partners, they're owners, and therefore they're not covered by the statute. Right. And then what you get into is, well, are they really owners? Do they really do the things that owners do? Are they, in fact, partners in name only, and therefore, um, in, in, in reality, they're employees and therefore subject to the statute. That's really where the rubber meets the road in these circumstances. If they are employees, then you can't have mandatory retirement. Right. I mean, it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. um, and so many law firms have been really um, grappling with this issue mm -hmm. and how to deal with it. And mm -hmm. some 
um, are just removing from the partnership agreements all reference to age. It's going to be, um, as uh, Anthony was saying, it's fact specific on whether you're really an owner as a partner or an employee, as it, as the EEOC alleges in the Kelly case and in the uh, Sidley Austin case. And I think that you know uh, law firms have to be mindful. And I think, as Anthony suggested, maybe the safer course and to comply with ADEA is to take those mandatory retirement provisions out and let the partners continue to work and to provide services for the clients, many of whom want to keep working with that particular partner. You know, they may have established a relationship with a partner. They may go to that law firm because of the skills and abilities of that partner and want to continue having him or her serve their needs. I think that um, jumping off on that point that it's not just the safer option, it's the smarter option. I think that good um, employers focus on criteria that are relevant to the, uh, the work being done. And I think that older workers often possess experience and skill and have real potential to bring value to um, businesses, whether it be a law firm or other business. And I think that um, by keeping the emphasis on merit, I think that uh, law firms and other employers will be served well, regardless of whether there are technical legal arguments that allow them to escape coverage of the laws. In the ideal, that sounds wonderful, but let's talk about, we talked about reduction in force. And we know that businesses have been through a tough five, six, seven, eight years, whatever it's been. I'm sure there are people, clients who come to you and say, Attorney Haller, I've just got to cut expenses. I, I, I mean, I may not get through the next year unless I cut back. And you can see what my payroll is here. And you know if I cut these people, I've got an age discrimination case, don't I, Attorney Haller? What do you do? Well, I mean, I think you have to well, help them work through how to achieve the cost reductions at, and at the same time not only comply with the letter of the law, but also do the things that protect and will protect them in the future against claims, which means having a procedure, having a set of stated reasons, being consistent in the selection decision, not making it all subjective. I mean, there are ways of doing that, and I think, as I said earlier, employers have become relatively sophisticated. It's interesting, though, you know, in terms of the debate we're having tonight, which is if you simply said, I want to take expense out, and I have 10 people who are over the age of 50 and they are my most expensive employees. My reason is cost. That's the only reason. It's a non-discriminatory reason. There are courts that will say that's not age discrimination. Mm -hmm. And it you know, arguably isn't in, uh, age discrimination under a treatment or a disparate impact theory. But I suspect under these new regs that that, that kind of decision making would be challenged. Mm -hmm. I think with the regs, you would have a big issue on that because you're not looking at the potential impact on the older workers. I mean, I think if you looked at, um, we're going to make a, a, a termination based on productivity and, you know, how much, I don't know, whatever the sales are, depending on the position, um, how much revenue they're generating, something that's more tangible. But if you're just basing it on costs that translates to salary that leads to 10 or 9 or 10 other people being let go over the age of 50, I think it's going to be very hard for the employer to justify a reasonable factor other than age. Even if that other choice is I may go out of business? I think that you need to, you know, saying we want to do an easy, easy way of having a, a layoff, you know, the last one in will be the first one let go. You could have an impact then on women or African Americans or Hispanics, so you could have a claim under Title VII. If you just say we want to cut costs, but you don't assess the harm that that could have on older workers, you might not be able to meet the reasonable factor other than age defense. Last hired, first fired would be a great policy, but businesses are, are not are really, as a rule, don't follow that kind of policy, Scott. Well, it, it would be a great- Sounds great in the ideal. It, it sounds great in the ideal as a way of avoiding lawsuits, but it does not sound like a very prudent business strategy. I think that um, while um, plaintiff's lawyers are very much concerned about discrimination laws being violated, none of us wish to see businesses run in ways that um, hurt their profitability. Um, yeah, see, he's on your side, Anthony. I knew, at least, <laughs> at least on that issue. We I'm on, on one issue. <laughs> I, I agree with Anthony that if the um, focus is on legitimate factors that are relevant to how the business is run and it should be run to make a profit and not um, based on things such as stereotypes based on age or other pro prohibited characteristics, I think that those employers are on the right track. But if we were to go back historically in this nation about 20 years, the age discrimination case has changed, maybe even dramatically. There was a time, and again, before you were in practice, Scott, that you could find emails and letters about let's get rid of this old bag, we don't need this gray hair, this old battle axe has to go. 
Um, employers and maybe employees have gotten a lot more sophisticated over the years. So this really is a chess game. It is really sometimes using another metaphor about building a better mousetrap, isn't it, Anthony? Well, these cases, um, and it's true in discrimination generally, but in, in this area in particular, it's rare that you have direct evidence of age discrimination. I remember seeing an old episode of LA Law where the person was on the witness stand and they're being cross-examined and they're asked what the reason and they say because of the age. Well, I would, you know, I would never defend that case and, <laughs> and Scott would love to have that. But that's, right. not, yes, the, <laughs> that's not the reality. The reality is that employers are sophisticated. And so what, what these cases come down to is um, how consistent the employer is in its ability to articulate its reasons, whether there are contradictions, and whether there are things sufficient to raise a question in a jury's mind as to whether the employer is really telling the truth or whether they're masking mm -hmm. some other reason. And if, if, as a plaintiff's lawyer, you can get them to question the reasons and say, well, there must have been another reason, and then you can say, well, what other reason would it have been other than their age? And when you have evidence, as Scott did, that you know, everybody in the reduction was over the age of 55 or whatever it was. That is certainly helpful. You know, Mary, and, and if we can, we can end here tonight. We've we've talked about this on this program. Sometimes people like to call this Roberts Court the pro corporate court, and that may be true in some instances. But when it comes to retaliation and some of these strictly employment matters, and I look at some of these age discrimination cases, we do not see some of the same politically divisive 5-4 decisions. We see, you know, Thomas voting with uh, Breyer, voting with Sotomayor, voting with Roberts. When it comes to matters of employment, strict employment matters, things that take place at the workplace, this Supreme Court cannot be easily pigeonholed. And if we had to take a bet, it looks like they're going out on a bit of a limb to make sure that the average worker is protected. Your thoughts? I think that um, it, we, we've seen some very good dis, uh, Supreme Court decisions recently in the, in the retaliation, um, going along with uh, what EEOC says that you know if an employer is taking any action to deter somebody from participating in the process or filing a charge, that's against the law. I think that in the um, reasonable factor other than age, I, I wish that the um, maybe the the standard for employers had been kind of in line with the standard on Title VII. Mm -hmm. um, but I can understand the reasoning why they um, went with the reasonable factor other than age. And you're right, it, it can't be pigeonholed. I think that employers need to be um, proactive when they're making employment decisions to try to make decisions based on qualifications. I mean, any of these statutes, the age one, any of the statutes that we enforce, is to make sure that people are judged on their ability to do the job, not on things that have no bearing, like your age, or whether you've complained about discrimination, or your gender, any of those prohibited characteristics. Scott, last words. Um, I think jumping off on the comment that it has indeed become in part um, how to build a better mousetrap, and I think that employers should spend um, their focus on how to comply with the law as opposed to learning better ways to evade it, and I think that that would um, uh, do us all well. Folks, if you need more information, it's easy. Go to our website, lawjournaltv.com. You can check us out on Facebook. Go to iTunes. Any program that we have produced here over the last year is up in all of that media. I want to thank my guests tonight for giving us a glimpse into the realm of age discrimination. Anthony Haller with Blank Rome in Center City, Philadelphia. Mary Tiernan with the EEOC, also in Philadelphia. And Scott Goldshaw joining us tonight with Salmonson Goldshaw also in Philadelphia. And for all of us here at the American Law Journal, thanks for joining us this week. We're actually going to be going on vacation, taking a nice long vacation this year as we get ready for our new 2012-2013 season. So we'll see you again in the fall. For all of us here, until next September, case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Blank Rome, providing strategic advice for employers in today's workplace. Scheller PC, protecting consumer rights since 1977. And The Legal Intelligencer, the nation's oldest legal newspaper for lawyers.